Teach me to walk in the light of His love. Teach me to pray to my Father above. Teach me to know all the things that are right. Teach me, teach me to walk in the Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Walk in the Light event. My name is Elder Sims. And my name is Elder Jensen, and we will be tonight's hosts. As our event gets started, we want to know where you're watching from. Make sure to comment down below and tag a friend who you want to tune in with you. Tonight, we will be joined by well-known YouTuber Dan Markham, known for his YouTube channel, What's Inside. However, before we hear from him, we are going to open up tonight's event with an opening musical number by five-year-old David DeFigurito. Following them, the opening prayer will be offered by Scott Taylor all of whom are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints living in the central Massachusetts area.
Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful to be together this evening for this sacred event. We are thankful for the opportunity we have to hear in both word and song those things which will bring thy spirit into our hearts and minds. We pray a blessing upon those who will participate in these, this event this evening, that they may be blessed in what they seek to convey in music and in word. We pray a blessing upon each who are in attendance tonight, that our hearts may be lifted, that we may have renewed hope in thy Son, Jesus Christ, and strength to move forward, especially in this time of pandemic. We ask these blessings and express our gratitude unto thee for all that we have in our lives that are good and all that is noble and right. For we know these things come from thee, Father. We say these things and ask these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for bringing the Spirit into our event. As we said before, tonight we are joined by Dan Markham. Dan Markham is the creator of the popular YouTube channel, What's Inside? The channel began back in 2014 when, as part of his son Lincoln's elementary school project, a question was posed and some videos were made. The question, what's inside different sports balls? The videos they made went viral later that year, and thus their channel was born. They have since gained over 7 million subscribers on YouTube and have nearly 1.2 billion views. The father and son duo travel around the world working with leading brands and top social media influencers. However, above it all, Dan's family and his faith remain the most important things in his life. We're excited to hear what he has to say. Dan, the time is now yours. Well, hello. Thank you guys for letting me join this walk in the light. Um, this is actually our studio. If you can't tell, like our everything's all around. I figured it'd be a good place to spend tonight. And um, before we get into too much, I would like to introduce you or welcome a couple of our family members. So. This is my wife, Leslie, and this is Lincoln. I think a lot of people probably know Lincoln. Um, today, he played in a golf tournament all day, so his face is a little wind burnt. It was cold yeah. and golfing. Very cold. But when we first started the YouTube channel, Lincoln was just this little guy in like second grade, and now he's in ninth grade, 15 years old, about yeah. to drive in a little bit here. And so, yeah, there's my family. <laughs> yes. But yeah. I think it's just going to be me tonight that's talking. But anyway, I wanted they're going to go and watch in the other room. Okay, but, have fun. Okay, okay see right, you thanks. guys. Bye. So anyway, the reason why um, I am here today is, um, first of all, like you guys said, that I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and our faith is really important to us. But the other reason, and one of the main reasons, is that there's an elder inside of this mission in Connecticut area and in, in Massachusetts area, Elder Cole Christensen. And he's been a family friend since, I don't know, 2009, I think, when he was just this little guy. And now he's a missionary and he's been on his mission for a while. And so I used to be his Cub Scout leader. We've actually been to the Boston area together. Um, so I've seen him grow up and it's pretty awesome that he's out there serving as a missionary and helping people and sharing positive messages, even during a time of a pandemic, which I would think would be a challenge as a missionary, but most of the missionaries that I've spoken to have said that they've actually found new ways to talk to people and to help people and to give service. And this right here, the walk in the light is another manifestation of that. It's a, it's something that was created due to the pandemic and due to a lot of missionaries being at home. And so, um, so tonight, here's what I want to do. I want to go over, so there's probably a lot of you that are like, who are you? I know they did a little bit of a rundown. Thank you, elders. But um, I'll give you a little bit of a rundown of our story, just from my perspective of like how we came to be YouTubers and like in this world. And then I'll share some of the thoughts that I have based off of things that I've learned um, over my lifetime. And of course, like over being a YouTuber that's helped me be grounded to become a better person and, and to hopefully be a good example and good influence for others. And hopefully some of the stories are fun for you guys and, and you enjoy them. So, um, but first of all, like I said, this is our YouTube studio. I'm going to turn the computer around. You can see I've got lights on right there. We have a bunch of sports cards there because that's one of the things we've been working on is sports card videos. We have a video that's not out yet, but this is blurred money. It's not real money, but it's like, it looks like real money, kind of funny. So anyway, there's a little behind the scenes. For those of you that are fans of our videos, you'll be seeing those videos soon and they'll be really fun. So um, I am going to try to share my screen real quick here and show you some of the stuff. Here we go, share screen. Okay, share screen. Okay. Oh, is it doing it? Nope, okay, here we go. 
Sorry, guys, I'm sharing my screen and we are doing this technology for the first time. Keynote, that's the one. Keynote share. All right, guys. No, it's not pulling up. Okay, I'm just going to tell you my story. Um, all right, so Lincoln, like you said earlier, we have a, we had a, he had a second grade science project. And in that project, he wanted to know like what's inside of sports balls. And so we cut open a bunch of different sports balls. We just cut them open, we put them on poster board. And then um, at the end of his, is basically so that he could get some extra credit at the end of his presentation. And he could say, um, go to my YouTube channel if you wanna watch my dad cutting these things open. That really was it. But I did go online and I posted those videos to YouTube like for his project, thought that was the end of it. And about a year later, it was really random. It was January, 2014 when we posted the first videos. By December, it was crazy. We made $4 in one day on ad revenue. And I was like, Lincoln, this is uh, some pretty good money there. $4 in one day for videos that have been posted for a year. I guess you can make money off of YouTube. What if we keep posting videos and then maybe by the time you turn 19 and you go on your your mission or if or when you go to college, you could have a little extra money. And do you want to keep cutting things open? He's like, sure, dad, let's do it. So I guess January 2015, that's kind of when What's Inside was born. And we started cutting open um, more sports balls. People started giving us suggestions like cut this open, cut that open. I'm not even like that good at cutting things open, but people enjoyed it. And what was cool is that even more than just enjoying the cutting something open, a lot of people came because of that, but then they stayed because they're like, oh, I kind of like these guys. I want to stick around and watch this. So within four months of starting officially the channel, we gained a thousand subscribers. So that was in April, 2015. And then <laughs> by July, all of a sudden things started to go viral. And we had, um, we had a video that was like, what's inside of a bowling ball? Leslie was in it, Lincoln was in it. And I bought a chop saw just to cut open this bowling ball. I was terrible at cutting it open, super dangerous. But it, we, we got a ton of views off of it and we started to gain subscribers. Enough that by August, we got 100,000 subscribers. Lincoln went to the local news, KSL, and he did a live segment showing what's inside of these different sports balls. It was really cool. And then we thought that was it. You know, We thought that was the end of it. But then in November, so still that same year, all of a sudden we got a million views within a 48 hour period. We cut open our award that YouTube gives you. That's like the, the oh, that one right there. Yeah, this one, like right back here. We cut that open and people went crazy. It got 5.5 million views in like a couple of weeks. And we couldn't believe that it was doing so well. And then fast forward to the next year, um, we cut open a rattlesnake rattle. And for some reason, people loved the rattlesnake rattle. It was like curiosity. It looked dangerous because you see in the thumbnail, it's like us cutting something open and people just had to click on it. And the wild thing was that in 2016, the rattles, what's inside a rattlesnake rattle was the third most viral video in the entire world. It got 42 million views in one week. I think it's at like 90 or 100 million views now all time. And it just became this thing that I didn't imagine, I couldn't have ever imagined that this is what would have happened, that we would have these people that would come and watch this and see us cut things open. But when it comes to um, how this has impacted our family, um, obviously like I stepped away from my old job. I used to be a pharmaceutical sales rep and I was a biotech sales rep and I would just go around to doctor's offices and talk about product. I loved my job. It was great. It was really, really fun. But um, this became even more fun. And it was cool because we'd start to travel around the world and people would come up to us and say hi and, and they would just randomly stop us on the street or at a sporting event. We'd start to get mail from people. And it, it wasn't until I started to get mail I, it wasn't, I, I didn't it realize like the grand impact, like, yes, there were views and yes, there were subscribers, but then I started getting messages from people that would say stuff like, you know, I grew up without parents that really loved me and I don't know what it is about you and Lincoln and your son and your relationship, but when I watch your videos, it makes me happy and it makes me feel like I can someday be a good father to a child. Like it's a real thing just by watching you. Um, I've had, we've had messages from people that have said that they were like on the brink of ending their life. And for some reason, watching our videos brought this joy to them and this hope that they could move on and go to college and someday be a, be a father and be with their kids. And that's when I realized that this is a lot more, um, than just cutting things open. We really are, um, sharing like who we are to the world being missionaries in a way, but not in a way 
that is, um, I don't know, not, not in like a direct way. We're not teaching them, but by example, we ended up helping a lot of people um, just basically feel better about their lives and to feel, honestly, they were feeling the spirit of our savior, Jesus Christ. And, and that is one of the things, the name of this is walk in the light. And it's interesting, the more that you walk in the light of Jesus Christ and put your faith in him, the more your light shines to other people and or his light shines through you and you can raise and help other people. And so um, one of the things that I've really studied a lot on in throughout this whole time is just like the whole premise of like being happy or being in the right place at the right time. And um, did I ever think I'd be a YouTuber? Absolutely not. Never. Did I ever think that I would have people that would listen to me or that I'd be able to comfortable talking to you guys right now? There's no way. Before I, I went on a mission for, for my church and in back in 1999, I went to the Philippines, place I was born. But I went when I was 19 years old. But leading up to that, our bishop would always say, hey, I'd like you to speak in church this Sunday for three minutes or for five minutes. And I'd be like, nope, <laughs> not happening. I am too nervous. I am too shy. There's no way I'm talking. And so the only time I gave a talk before my mission was my mission farewell. Like that was it. It was when I was leaving for two years to go teach people about faith and about Christ. And I hadn't even given a talk in front of people because I was so nervous and so shy. And, and going back to like us starting the YouTube channel, the whole reason why I had, we did these science projects and we put them online was because I was scared that Lincoln was going to go through the same thing that I went through, where he was going to be incredibly shy all growing up. And then it might hold him back from opportunities that he could have. So I'd have him give these presentations and we'd film them. We did it the year before and we filmed it. It's not on the internet right now, but it's like we have these moments of him teaching and talking. And so I do think it's interesting that now um, just from one weakness that I had of being so shy, I've come this far that I'm still by no means a fantastic speaker, but it's amazing that we've talked to about one and a half billion people around the world or one and a half billion views just in our videos that we've been able to help people. Um, so there's a few stories along that that I wanted to share. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that things in our life doesn't don't happen by accident and that God has a bigger hand in our life than what we even know. Um, there's, there's a story in the newspaper that I read a while back where there's this family in Los Angeles, they were moving out of their apartment and it was about, it was like an eight story apartment complex and they were moving all their things out, throwing it in the back of their U-Haul truck. And then they'd go back up the elevator and then they'd load the elevator up and then they'd go back down and just back and forth. They're getting near the end of the day. They have this big mattress. They go in, they get into this big elevator, the elevator starts going down and then it just stops. Like it is just stuck and there's nothing they can do. Like they can't move this elevator. For about an hour, they're like calling the fire department, pushing that little button on the elevator. For an hour, it's not moving. There's nobody's helping them and they're just stuck. <clears throat> After this hour is over, and this is like one of the last things they would have been done for the day and like been out of there. They're frustrated. They're like, what is going on? We, this is, we're tired. The elevator finally, after an hour, just starts working again. They go down to the bottom floor. They get the mattress. They're like, all right, let's finish this up. They walk outside of the apartment complex and they, they hear there's a couple people over on the side and they hear like some commotion and they look up and four stories up is this boy that's probably three years old that's just hanging on the outside railing of their little deck and just messing around on it, playing around. And they're terrified. Everybody on the ground is terrified. This couple took their mattress, ran over there. They, they turned the mattress so that they could catch him in case he fell. And right at that moment, he slips, he falls down four stories, lands on the mattress, pops up, is totally fine. Turns out this boy, he had pretty severe autism, didn't understand what the calls were, what people were saying to him, and didn't understand the danger he was in. And those people were there at the right place at the right time. And personally, I believe that God was there making sure that the elevator stopped at that moment for the right amount of time so that it could go out there. And I think there's a lot of things in our life that happen that we might get really angry. You're in a traffic jam. You're waiting. You're, you're frustrated because you're in this traffic jam. And then you think, and then once you get up to the accident, you see that there's this massive accident that just happened minutes earlier. And off, oftentimes in my life, whenever I see that, I think back, what happened leading up to this? Like one time I saw a big accident and I've remembered back that 
I had forgotten my binder that I needed for work. I was heading to the airport. It, I turned around and went back. It cost me an extra five minutes and I was all bothered and frustrated when it turns out there's a giant accident that I could have been in. And so I do believe that God protects us and like leads us. I didn't know I was going to be a YouTuber, but I think God knew and he knew the things that we could do and that we would, we would help people in some ways in no way am I perfect, but, and, but we are able in our, in our way to help people. And so, um, the, one of the questions that when it, when it comes to our life, like I think a lot of people get stressed out and maybe especially with the pandemic and with people stuck at home, a lot of times people question like, like, uh, or they get stuck in a rut and they question like, why is this happening? And going back to those stories, I think it's important that, that we take a step back, even when things are hard, things are difficult and we don't understand the why this is happening, that we do put faith in Jesus Christ and know that he is watching us and that we, we have our heavenly father that's going to help us, help us do the right things. And, um, one thing that one thing that I one story I think is interesting in the Bible is Jonah and the whale. Like it's so interesting how Jonah is told to go to Nineveh. He's like, you got to go there and you got to do this thing. God tells him, and he's like, you know what? No, I'm not going to do it. And it, it kind of makes me think about like what happens when we don't do what we're supposed to do. Like obviously we should be like doing the right things, following commandments, being kind to others. None of us are perfect, and sometimes we don't do the right thing. And when I see what happened with Jonah and the whale, it's kind of a good example of even sometimes when we don't aren't doing the right things, God will still step in. He still has our back and he still is there to love us and protect us and teach us in those moments. So Jonah goes, gets on, goes the opposite way of Nineveh, goes out there, gets on the boat. The seas are incredibly wild. Finally, he tells everybody, hey, so the this, this seas are pretty wild because turns out I was supposed to go to Nineveh and I said, no, I told God I wasn't going to. And they're like, okay, yeah, this isn't going to work. Throw him off the boat. He gets swallowed up by a whale and <laughs> crazy story. It's not even the end of the story for him. Like basically the whale takes him, spits him out on the shore. He ends up going to Nineveh. He's later than he should have been. He learned a very important lesson. He teaches people and does the things that he needs to do. And so I, I would say, I, obviously we want to choose the right and walk in the light and do the right things always. But I think it's important in life. Life is too short. It really is too short for us to get caught up in maybe the mistakes that we've made and the things where we've done something that maybe we're not proud of. And we can still take a minute, go repent for it, tell our Heavenly Father that we're sorry and that we won't do that again and get back on the path and not be too ashamed. That's God is always rooting for us, just like a, a, a parent is for a child. No matter what my kids do, I love them so much. I can only imagine how much God loves us because I love my son. He's 15 years old. In a few years, he's going to be out of the house and it's sad. But at the same time, like I love him no matter what. And God is that way even more. Um, there's when I was back in the drug industry, as in the drug industry, um, and especially right now with the pandemic, we see that I think it's 500,000 people have died during this pandemic from covid um, it, 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 you can't help but reflect a, upon like your own life and like looking back on it, like what things, what regrets you might have if I got sick today and tomorrow was the last day. There's a nurse that there's a caregiver, like a hospice nurse in Australia that she was a hospice nurse for 30 years. She wrote a book about the five regrets that people have on their deathbed. And so I thought it was fascinating. It's really interesting because there were some common threads and some things that people just, they, they, it's just a common thing and regrets that they have. So I'm going to read you some of the regrets. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about them. And maybe right now you can think about it. Like what would the regrets be? Like what could they possibly be? Okay. So here we go. Regret number one, the most common. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. And she says in this, that this is the most common regret of all. When people realize that their life is almost over and they look back on it clearly, it's easy to see how many dreams have gone unfulfilled. People had not even honored half of their dreams and had to die knowing that it was due to the choices that they made or didn't make. So health brings a freedom that very few realize until it's gone. Um, so ah, that's a tough one. Obviously, like Lincoln and I are living a dream right now, but um, I, there's definitely 
moments in your life where you get stuck in a rut and you just feel like that you're just doing the same thing all the time. And maybe you don't know what you just want to, you're just stuck to working too hard or doing certain things. I think it's important to know that if you have some dreams, don't be afraid to reach for them. Don't be afraid to try to go down that road and achieve the dreams that you have within reason, of course. And when you're doing it with faith that Jesus is there protecting you and watching you as you choose the right, as you have faith in him, that a lot of your dreams can come true. This life truly is very short. Eternal life is going to be very long, but this life that we're living right now is short. And it's important that we, that we, that we fulfill our dreams or look, try to do, fulfill our dreams. The second one, very common one. I think a lot of you guys would have guessed this. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Turns out pretty much every male patient that this nurse nursed had this same, this was it. This was like one of the most common ones, almost all of them. I worked, I wish I hadn't worked too hard. They missed their children's soccer games. They missed their baseball games. They didn't, they didn't go on a trip with them. They, maybe they didn't spend enough time with their spouse and they could have gone on some meaningful dates or just spent some time just sitting and talking to their spouse more instead of just working so hard, always at that computer, always working. So very, very common. Instead of just being on that treadmill of work and then on your deathbed going, wait a second, was that important? People's work is important, but at the same time, not really as important as spending that quality time. So the third one, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. Um, a lot of times people were afraid to share their feelings for others, loved ones, tell them that they loved them, or maybe have a conversation about something that, that bothered them to clear the air or to forgive somebody. Um, so that's a common one. Another one, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. Very common at the end of life. And then this last one, um, this one has been like a goal of my life is to study happiness and to study how to be happy and what brings happiness. And the fifth one is right along with that. It's, I wish I had let myself be happier. Um, and she says, this is a surprisingly common one. Many didn't realize until the end that happiness is a choice. They stayed stuck in old patterns and habits, the so-called comfort or familiarity Oh, it overflowed into their emotions as well as their physical lives. Fear of change stopped them from um, doing the things that caused them to be truly happy. And so in my studies of happiness, I thought it was really interesting. Japan, we've done some videos in Japan, um, some really fun videos. Like it's one of my favorite places. And when the world reopens again, our whole family is going to go to Japan again because we went there for spring break a few years ago. And my kids, it was one of their favorite places. The people are just so kind, so loving out there. They're so respectful. Um, but there's a couple things that we can learn about happiness from the Japanese. One, there's an actually a word called karoshi. I'm probably saying it wrong, but it's karoshi. And literally this word translated means work to death. Seriously, that's what it means. And it's very common. It's common enough that the government has recognized this as an issue. There are groups that are support groups that help women whose husbands have worked to death. Um, that's a culture where people in especially near Tokyo and the big cities where people will work all day and night, they'll leave their house and be gone for three months and just work day and night, super hard. And they also don't, they also are ashamed if they do something wrong. And so there's instances where somebody working at Toyota was on the phone and he's, he was in charge of quality control and something went wrong that day. He called his boss. He's on the phone from the assembly line, talking to his boss and getting in trouble for making a mistake. And he has so much shame that he had a heart attack and died right there. Like there's a documentary about this and it's, it was, it's heartbreaking to hear that. It's so sad. But what's also interesting is that the happiest place on earth and the longest living people is in Okinawa, Japan. And their people are incredibly happy. They spend a lot of time together. They are very social. They eat together. They do activities together. They're always spending time with the younger kids. And there's a city there that's called it's like, it's the, they call it longevity village where they have the oldest people in the world. There's like multiple people over the age of 101 years old. And it's, and there are a lot of correlations with health and good health when you are happy. And so I have strived for years to um, make sure that I'm doing the things in my life that would, will bring happiness. And so when my wife and I met, when we very first met back in the day, back in like 2001, I was just back from my church mission from the Philippines and she was in, we were, she was in the singles ward. Um, I went to the singles ward and I'd been there for about six months. Or, and so I was 
basically at church and it's for people that are between the ages of like 18 and 30 that weren't married yet. And that's, that's where we met every Sunday. And they do this thing where they assign you at the time to like help out with somebody like they call it a home teacher. And so as a, as two people, you would go and once a month check on these people and they assigned me to be Leslie's home teacher. And so um, I'm like, okay, I'll go meet this girl and, and I will go and, and, and uh, talk to her about whatever. Well, when I met her, obviously I felt at that moment, there was something more like with the second that I met her, I knew it was bigger than just, I'm going to be your home teacher. And now here we are many, many years later, that was 2001. Yeah. 20 years ago. Crazy. It's been over 20 years. That's wild. I just realized that. Um, but that day I shared a scripture with her and it's a scripture from the book of Mormon and it's my favorite book of Mormon verse. And what's funny is that ever since I was 20 years old, this has been my favorite book of Mormon verse, maybe even before that actually. And still it's the same because in this life that I think that's one thing, no matter where you are in life, people have this inherent desire to be happy and they want to find happiness and joy. And that's one thing that the gospel of Jesus Christ brings you and can bring you is joy and happiness. I felt it in my life more than anything in the world is when I do have the spirit and when I'm choosing the right and when Jesus Christ is leading my life in a way giving me blessings based off of the things that I deserve and a lot of the things that I don't deserve, but still giving me blessings. There's a scripture, it's it's in the book of Mormon and it's Mosiah 2, chapter 2, verse 41. And it's, it, I'm just going to read it to you here. It's like, um, and moreover, I would desire that you should consider on the blessed and happy state. So the happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. So those, that I'm, I know I'm like already paraphrasing, but basically those that keep the commandments of God, and the, he was like, I want you to think about these people, the people that how happy the people are, they keep the commandments. And then he says, this is King Benjamin. He was a, he's a king back then and, and super knowledgeable. He says, for behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. And if they hold out faithful until the end, they are received into heaven that thereby they may dwell with God in a state of never ending happiness. Oh, remember, remember that these things are true for the Lord God had spoken it. At the simplest level in life, I think a lot of us, no matter what our situation is, we desire to be happy. And he's, King Benjamin says it well in the scripture. There's two areas that we desire happiness. Our temporal, basically temporal, meaning like the house over our head, having a bed to sleep in, having clothes on our back, having some food that we can eat. But then also the spiritual side of things. Um, you can have all of those things in life temporarily and still not be happy. So it's like a combination between temporal and spiritual. And what King Benjamin teaches us, he's like, take a look at those that keep the commandments of God. They are some happy people, not only happy, but he says they're blessed also. And so I've strived to keep the commandments a lot of times, do the things that I know that I should do. Sometimes when I have a solid testimony about it and I understand those things are true. And then sometimes maybe I don't know fully why it's true, but I know it's a commandment and I still follow it, but I always do receive those blessings, both temporally and spiritually. Um, in the in the thing about happiness that I was telling you about earlier, and there's a documentary, they asked, does money buy happiness? That was the question. And I feel like this is a very common question. I bet a lot of you have thought like, Man, I remember when I was on my mission, there's a lot of missionaries that are on here right now. I remember when I was on my mission and I was like, when I get out, I'm going to work so hard. I'm going to make so much money. My mission president was like a farmer that was so successful. And I'm like, I'm going to be doing that. And in this documentary, they make some really important points. They do actually, there's multiple studies that have researched a correlation between money and happiness. And what they found was, yes, there is a correlation between how much money you make and happiness, but there's a caveat to that. It's only that level, like thirty to fifty thousand dollars in the United States a year, that pays for the essential needs: the roof over your head, the shirt, your food, those things that take you out of pure poverty at this level in America. That can elevate your level of happiness. Anything above that, it doesn't have any correlation. In fact, th sometimes the more money you make. It can have a negative correlation on your happiness because you're focused on the wrong things. This isn't me. This is actual scientists that have studied this, probably in Boston, like at Harvard, there are some studies. But, but anyway, I thought that was really interesting. It's okay. It's okay to want to be successful and financially. I think that's one of the most common questions we get as YouTubers, like how much money do you make? How do you make money? Because it's such an unknown thing. We do well with it, but all the, at the same time, 
we have to make sure that we are grounded because the money does not bring happiness and that you have to have follow the commandments, live righteously, have the spirit of God with you, be serving others, helping others, and hopefully not keeping a bunch of these regrets, those five regrets on your list so that you are spending time with the loved ones, telling them how you feel and trying to follow your dreams and try to let your, just let yourself be happy. Um, when I was in the Philippines where I was, I was actually born there, which was really cool. And, and I served there as a missionary. There's a couple different instances where the prophet of our, the prophet went there, the prophet of our church. And when one of them was back in the sixties and it was um, president Gordon B. Hinckley. And he went there and opened up the Philippines two missionaries being allowed to be going there. And he always heard from people that the missionaries that was, I mean, sorry, the Filipinos that, the common thing was they they had a hard time paying tithing. It's very common in the Bible talks about tithing, giving a tenth of what you earn, and um, and that was a really hard thing for a lot of people. It, not only in the Philippines, but obviously all over the world. But the Filipinos, especially, they're like, "Hey, look at this. We've got like literally a metal roof over our head, dirt on the floor. We're eating rice for three three months with like leaves on top of it because we don't have money to buy any chicken or any actual toppings for it." Um, how are we going to pay 10% of our tithing? And President Hinckley made a promise to them, and he promised them that as they paid their tithing, that the windows of heaven would open up, and he promised them that they would have a roof over their head, a shirt on their back, and rice in their bowls. And he promised them that as they followed that promise. And I think that's something that no matter what stage of life that you're in, you can see that as you keep the commandments, as you do, do what's right and think more from an eternal perspective, it's then you can, you'll, you will have those blessings that will bring that happiness in your life. Some of you might be like, oh, if I was just a YouTuber, man, if I had millions of people, if I could just go anywhere in the world and people would like, hey, I know you, you're from YouTube or companies reach out, like we get to do some pretty cool things. Like Lincoln and I interviewed Bill Gates three weeks ago, like on this computer in this room right here. And we get to do cool things. But at the end of the day, on an eternal perspective, that stuff doesn't matter as much. It's cool and it's fun, but happiness is about internally you choosing to be happy and you connecting with your heavenly father and doing what's right. And so that the, the real blessings can come to you. And so um, I am a firm believer that um, this church is true and that our savior is watching us and helping us every step of the way, whether we make right decisions or not, hopefully we're making right decisions. But if we allow ourselves to, to repent for the problem, the mistakes that we've made and forgive ourselves and move forward, no matter what we've done, and we can choose to be happy and do the right things, we will have a pretty good life, whether it's one more day of our life or it's 90 more years of our life. Um, after this life, we, I do believe that families will be together forever. And um, that's definitely a goal of mine is to be there with my family and friends and to be able to look back on this life and say, you know what? I did a good job at being kind to others. And so I served people. I did things right. I was a good example and helped other people in the world. And I hope that that happens. And, and I believe that as we bring Christ into our lives, that can happen. So Anyway, I'm going to leave there for now, and we are going to open it up to Q&A, but I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, yeah, if you guys have questions, I'd love to chat with you. Thanks for letting me talk. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dan, for your words. I really loved what you were talking about time, about God's time and trusting in his time. It can be a little hard at times because it can seem unnecessarily slow or unnecessarily fast, but <laughs> it is perfect. We can trust in that. Yeah, I mean, one of my one of my things that I I um, love doing, which is super random, is I love doing stair races. It's so weird, but I like climbing. I, I have this goal to climb this to run the stairs of the tallest building in every state. I've done like twenty one of the United States states in the United States, and I I always thought about compared that to like that exact thing. Sometimes, it, sometimes when we're like living the we have these goals and we're working hard. A lot of times people give up and they might be on like the top floor of the building on the last step. They're about to complete that race, but maybe they don't know that they're on the last step and they're like, I'm done. I'm out of here. Um, we don't know. We don't know how, when it is, God's going to give us those blessings that we, that are promised to us. But just if we give up, it, it could be right at that moment before it comes to us. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, we're going to go ahead and we're going to hop into our first question of the night. Perfect. Perfect. 
from Jennifer Christensen. <laughs> he says, Dan, as a YouTuber, you have had many opportunities to serve others. What stands out as one of your most memorable experiences? Oh man, um, this the, right before the pandemic hit. Thank you, Jen Christensen. Um, I, last year, right before the pandemic started, well, link. I had this idea. I have a friend that is <clears throat> he's a really good friend, and he's married this girl. And what's amazing is this girl. She's disabled from. She's in a wheelchair. She broke her back, broke her spine years ago, and they met. They they dated, and they're getting married. And I'm like, what can I give this guy? That's just for a present. Like I, if I give him pots and pans, he's going to be like, yeah, that's good. I could, I could have bought that. He'll, he'd be grateful either way, but I'm like, he can buy what he needs. Um, what can I do for him? And so I had this crazy idea. And so I took my daughter, we flew to Kenya and we spent a good amount of money and we built desks for an entire school. Like all these kids, they don't, they didn't have any desks in the school. And we made this full on video, didn't tell him we were doing it. And then we gave him this video as a present and, and all of them said Zach and Cambry on it. And what was cool is we we had a donation link in that video for the fans. If they wanted to help donate, we were going to try to build an entire school. And from that link in about six months or five months, we gained $35,000 in donations. And so we were able to take that money and, and build two school buildings, beautiful, nice buildings, full of desks, brand new. And we took Zach and Cambry. I took my wife and kids. And we all went down there and spent two days just celebrating with the entire village. Like then it was like the greatest moment for them. And it was so cool to see how happy they were to have a school. And I don't know, it's, it's nice when we can use our platform for good and find ways to help other people. I think, I think there's a lot of selfish side of things when you, that you could potentially go down that road and like when you're a YouTuber, but um, it's nice when we can go back and like actually serve and help somebody. So that was, that was a memorable one. And also it was the last international trip that I took before the borders shut down. So, <laughs> wow. Thanks for sharing that. That was such an, such an amazing experience. Um, I know that I definitely was touched by that because God often gives us abilities and talents that are for others and not just ourselves. So I'm so glad that you've found that and you've been able to bless others through that. Thank you. Yeah, of course. We're going to go ahead and pull up our next question. And that is from Peyton Wright. And she asked, what are blessings you have seen from being successful in YouTube? Man, I, I could go on forever. I really could. Um, I, uh, the reason why we started even doing the videos, like I said earlier, was because I didn't want Lincoln to be shy like I was. And um, well, one of the regrets that people had is like, I wish that I hadn't worked so hard. Well, now when I travel places, and do work, I get to do it with my family and I get to take my son. And I feel like I haven't missed out on a lot of things for my kids. And that's one of the greatest blessings is that I can, I I've spending this, these years that where I'm healthy, where my kids are growing so fast, I can't believe how fast they're growing. And instead of spending it all at work, I get to spend a lot of time with them and see them grow. Like, um, just, seeing my son be able to interview somebody like like bill gates when i was too nervous to talk in front of 70 people in a church house for three minutes um that is such a huge blessing to see some of that come come around so that's that's the one that comes to mind first obviously there's a lot of other blessings but i'll, I'll instead of going on forever about the answer that's that's the one that comes to the top of my head that's awesome it's so great when we have more time to spend with our families our families are something that God has given us to experience joy, which is one of the purposes of this life. Uh, and so that's awesome that you've been able to find more time through YouTube to be with your family. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and we'll pull up our next question, which comes from Calvin Rushton, who asks, what is the best thing I can do to prepare for a mission? Good question. And you're, these guys right here will probably be the ones, Elder Jensen, Elder Sims will probably be the ones that could help you with that too. But um, from when I prepared for my mission, I did take like a class that was like a preparation. I, it was at a, it was at an, an institute, like a college nearby and they had institute and it was like a mission prep class. I took it three times. <laughs> you only need to take it for like one semester and you don't, there's no credit for it, but I took it a bunch of times. Um, I think just preparing yourself spiritually, just, they, I think today is a trickier age because social media and connections, like when I was on my mission, I didn't have a cell phone. Cell phones just were coming out and people would only text in the Philippines with them and only a few people had them. 
I would only hear from my parents like every month or two. Um, now I understand you guys get to call home once a week, which is great. I called home four times on my mission, but I will say like every time that I called home, it was hard. Like I was sad for a few days cause I was like, oh man, I loved my mission, but it was hard. So if I were a missionary preparing in today's day and age, take some times. It's funny cause I'm a YouTuber and social media Take some times to just shut down social media. Take some times to shut down your phone. Like just put away your phone for a while, make it more extreme in that aspect than what it will be on your mission. Cause you will be able to talk to your family. You still will have Facebook from what I understand now on the social media side of things, but maybe take a few months and shut down and, and spend a little extra time on the scriptures and studying that side of it. Um, I did hear a, there was a talk the other day in church and this guy had a thought of what he was doing and I thought it was really good. So when you do have your phone and you are using your phone a lot, use your screen time and look at it and see how long you have like the LDS tools app turned on and um, could be fun for a few weeks to try to have a little competition to say, I'm going to make the LDS tools, the LDS, the LDS library, not the tools, but the gospel library on there where the scriptures are and everything. I'm going to try to make that in my top one or two every day for like two weeks and see if you can do it. See if you can use that app more than any other app on your phone and use your phone for good. And I think as you read the scriptures and, and get ready that way and disconnect from some of the social side of things, it'll make that transition to the mission a little easier because you'll spiritually be more prepared for it. So, yeah. That's perfect. Um, yeah, the more that we're disconnected from, from the distractions in life and more connected with God, that's where blessings come and everything. Oh, perfect. one side note, one other thing, missionary. I don't know. This is a different one. This, this is something I did when I got my mission call. I know most people, especially back when I got my mission call, you get everybody together and you'd open it up and you'd read it and people would cheer or you'd be like, what? I'm going there. I'm not so happy about that. I was super worried about it when I was getting my mission call. And so what I decided to do, which I don't think a lot of my friends and family were super happy about at the time, but I'm like, this mission is, is in a way for me. Like I'm the one going, it's not my friends and family. I love them and they're great, but I'm the one that needs to be okay at this decision. And I wanted to make sure I was. So I got my mission call. I went into my room. I listened to some good music. I read the scriptures for a bit. And then I said a really long prayer. And I was just like, help me, help me know that this is the right place that I should go. No matter where it is in the world, please give me that confirmation that this is it. This is the place. And then I opened it up as soon as I got to the Philippines. I never thought I'd go back there. I was born there, but usually I'm like, I bet they're going to look at that and go, he expects to go there. So we're not going to send him there. So I didn't even think of it as a possibility, but I was so overcome with like this feeling of this is exactly where I need to go. And these are the people I need to be with. And um, I have seen videos of people that read theirs and they're really upset. Like, I don't want to go to Idaho or I don't want to go to Salt Lake City or I don't want to go to Argentina, whatever it is. And I think if you realize like that is between you and Heavenly Father to, to know that that, to sit, that is the right place, that's where he wants you to go. It can be a good thing to read it on your own and be in the spiritually right place. And then you can still surprise your family and like read it to them and they'll all be surprised and happy for you. But that initial moment, maybe give yourself the chance to ask Heavenly Father if it's right. And sometimes in front of your family, like that may not be the right place. So maybe that's a controversial idea, but that's what I did. <laughs> That sounds, that's great advice. Thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate that. And we're going to go and now pull up our next question. And that is from Juliana Cornbridge. And she asked, what are some things you implement in your prayers that you think could be useful for everyone? Well, I mean, I, I just shared kind of that thing about your personal prayers and how ask for things to be right. I, I would try to stick to a lot of times I'll say prayers that are just thankful prayers. And it's just saying things that I'm thankful for. And it goes along with what I talked about earlier about being happy. Um, the more that you're thankful for things, the it's like the more things are going to come your way. It's so weird to say that it's like, you're going to get more blessings when you're more thankful or you do the, but it really does happen. Like we read it in the scriptures. And so the more you can be thankful for things, the more God is going to be like, yeah, I'm going to bless him more. Like it's a very common thing when one of your kids, tells you he's, they're thankful for things a lot, you're going to want to give them more things. When your kids come up to you and they're always nagging you and asking you for things, it gets a little, it gets a little uh, <laughs> frustrating sometimes and you almost want to give them less. I'm not saying that's what God does to us. I'm sure <laughs> blessings are free to everyone and they go out. But, but man, I, 
it, it, I feel like it does put you in a better mindset. Um, there's this, I was, I was, there's a book that's out recently, it's a little side note on it, but there's a book out that's about um, the placebo effect. And it's really interesting because it's a, it's a doctor talking about, I used to be in the pharmaceutical sales industry. They talk about how in clinical trials, you give placebo to people, it's not even the drug at all, and people still see the benefits of it. And you can actually go on Amazon and buy placebo pills, like placebo anxiety pills. It's nothing, it's sugar. And it actually helps people. And that boy, the reason why I bring that up is because it goes back into our own mindset of like being happy and being thankful for things. Because what they found is that the more people think their mind has more control over their body physically even than what they even know. And the more grateful we are for things, the more God's going to help us. So, yeah. That's awesome. I, I love the idea of having gratitude prayers solely dedicated to thanking God for what we have. I know that when I've done that in my life, it's been a huge, awesome blessing to be able to see the blessings that follow. So thank you for that advice. Yeah. We'll hop into our next question, which comes from Matthew Alexander, who asks, Dan, how has your family come closer together through the, through the development of your YouTube channel? Well, I mean, we, my wife worked for a company called Honeywell before. She's a communications director. I was a pharmaceutical sales rep. I lived in Albuquerque for a while, lived in Salt Lake for a while, and I covered eight states and I was always flying and traveling. And Leslie, she would work while the kids were young. She, it was before this whole, now everybody works from home, but she was so unique that she had her computer and she did calls and she worked from home in a pretty high profile job. And it was really rare at the time, but she managed it so well. But now that we are able to do YouTube, I don't want you to think it's not a lot of work because it is a ton of work. We work really hard, but there is that flexibility to be able to spend more time with the family and do things where um, we go on trips. Uh, if we go to Hawaii, for example, we can use the whole thing as we make a video on it. We've had opportunities to go stay at really nice hotels. They provide it for free and we take this trip and it's like forced family time, really fun. Um, our friends, the Christensen's, Elder Christensen that's in the mission and Jennifer Christensen who asked the question earlier, they have a houseboat at Lake Powell in Utah and we did a video on it. It's like MTV crib style where Elder Christensen's son, our brother Ty, was like the host and he's like, check out my houseboat. We made a video on it. First of all, we can like write off the whole thing as like a business expense. But in our old jobs, there's no way we could have said, hey, we're going to go out to the lake for a week and sit on a boat and spend time as a family and not check and have no cell service. And so um, that's been really nice to be able to have more time with our family and, and YouTube's definitely allowed that. So yeah, that's that's. I guess that's part of the answer there. <laughs> that's awesome. I think that's perfect. Just like my grandparents say, family time is treasure time. <laughs> <laughs> treasure time. Nice. Yep. Quality <laughs> time is always, always the answer. Um, we've loved having this Q&A section. Um, we only have time for one more question. So we're going to go ahead and bring that up now. And that is from Samantha Gonzalez. And she asked, what would you say to someone who is having a hard time believing that others can change and repent? Well, I mean, I think I covered a lot of that. Thank you, Samantha. I think I covered a lot earlier about just that, you know, Jonah and the whale and he changed and repented and was able to come back. Um, I think I think God is a lot more forgiving of us than what we give him credit for. I've felt that sorrow. Like I've felt that sickness of just feeling like you've done something wrong and you're just, you feel like you just want to crawl away in a corner and not see anybody ever for the rest of the week or whatever. And you're in depression and you're sad and you're down. But I'll tell you, God wants nothing more than for us to be happy in this life. It is the purpose of our life here and our life after is to be happy, to have eternal happiness. And so, yes, it's okay to be sorrowful and sad for mistakes that we've made, but we do need to trust and be grateful that our that, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to have the atonement, didn't do it for nothing, but he gave it so that we can repent for our sins. And part of that repentance is forgetting and forgetting and just forgetting and for, yeah, forgiving ourselves and forgetting about what happened and moving on. Um, you're always going to have a little bit of a scar of, of that. And it hopefully, hopefully you can learn from your mistakes and learn from things that you've done or people that you've hurt. You can make those wrongs right again. But um, life is way, way, way too short and way too important 
for us to live with regret and to live with sorrow over a decision that we made or somebody that maybe sinned and did something wrong. And if we sit here and, and have a hard time for forgetting, forgiving them, doesn't mean that we have to be like with them 24 seven, but if we can forgive them and move on with our life and be, be happy and live righteously and try to find what that joy is in our life, um, that's what God wants. And the quicker that we realize that and, we realize that this life, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So yes, you'll have your down times, you'll have your up times. But I think if we realize that God does love us so much that obviously he sent his only son so that we can have eternal life and have happiness. And it's that I study a lot, not because I'm like some perfect happy person, but because it does help me be happier to study it. And when I do have down times, I can lean on those things that I've studied. So I mean, I would stick to the scriptures, find some talks. There's so many good inspirational books out there from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but also people that are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that have really good things that can uplift us and spiritually and mentally help us get out of that because, yeah, it's hard. And I feel you, like, repentance is not an easy process, and it's hard to come to terms with maybe what we did, but let's put it on Heavenly Father and let's move on and find happiness and find ways to help others. So that's awesome. That's, that's perfect. Uh, this life is all about repentance and about change and about becoming better. So I think you had a perfect answer there. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you for, for all your answers tonight. It's been awesome to have you here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I, hopefully that was helpful for, for somebody. I'm always nervous, even though we do this all the time, we get on videos, you know, talking about, I'd say this is definitely different than making a YouTube video. We're not, looking inside of some random money thing like instead we're seeing like what's inside of my heart and my soul and like sharing some of that to you guys so thanks for giving me the chance and hopefully hopefully there's something positive for somebody there that's awesome well uh we are now going to have a closing musical number that will be performed by elder moncrief sister mellow and sister uh, lindberg and following them we'll have a closing prayer by chris lapierre, uh, lapierre. And we will go to that point. We'll bring you back up. You can share any last thoughts that you have. Cool. Thanks. Covering all in white perfume. 
Father, we're grateful for the opportunity we've had to listen and learn from the insights and experiences shared today. We ask thee to help us to be able to recognize the blessings that we receive in our life and to similarly be able to walk in the light of Jesus Christ. And these things we ask and pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Thank you again, Brother Markham, for coming on. We're so happy that we had you. Yeah, thank you. And wow, talk about good music numbers. Both of those were so good. Like, got the chills over here. That felt good. That was nice. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, so the time is now yours for any last thoughts that you might have. Okay, wow. Okay, well, thank you. I know that uh, there's probably a lot of missionaries on this call or this video stream also. And just want to say thank you for letting me take a part of your night. And all of you that are watching, um, yeah, I, I hope that you gain something. I hope that you feel the spirit through some of it, even though I'm not the most eloquent speaker ever. But um, I'm grateful for this opportunity. And and thank you, Elder Jen, Jensen and Elder Sims. Absolutely. Thank you. I know that, that what you shared was something that I needed to hear tonight. And I know that other people needed to hear it as well. Um, thanks again so much for being here. And thank you all um, for tuning into this Walk in the Light. Um, we hope to see you again next week. We have these every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we invite you guys, if you didn't have any questions that were answered tonight, to please send them into the page. And we'll see if we can get those answered for you. Thank you so much. And we hope you all have a lovely night. Night. Thanks, guys.